Um, but thank you everybody for joining us um, East Hampton Library. Um, we are joined today by Kelsey and they are a ranger at the Fire Island National Seashore and they're going to be doing a program today on horseshoe crabs for us. So thank you so much Kelsey for being here um, and thank you everyone for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much. It's really nice to be here. Um, it's always good to be here in a virtual space. It's nice to talk to people over the computer. Uh, but I do look forward to seeing folks. And um, so, uh, as you mentioned, I am a ranger at Farla National Seashore. You can imagine rangers, we feel very connected to the outdoors. Uh, cyberspace is fun and it's nice, but that's all to say, uh, I really want to see folks coming out to Fire Island at some point. I hope to visit East Hampton Library sometime soon as well. Um, really glad to be here. Today we're going to be talking about something that's really cool. Um, the humble horseshoe crab, one of my favorite Fire Island creatures, uh, probably one of the coolest, maybe uh, most alien animals that you can find on all of Fire Island. Uh, we couldn't have picked a better time to spotlight these guys uh, because right now, during the months of May and June, this is their spotting season. So sometimes you'll see them like this, like behind me, this, this image that I have for my backdrop, where there will be, you know, Typically around Long Island, you might see a couple dozen together. You might get lucky and see maybe a hundred of them on a beach, but this is maybe a little further south. You'll see this in Chesapeake Bay and even in North Carolina, where there will be just thousands of them on our beaches. Um, so that means, you know, if uh, you were going to spot horseshoe crabs in the wild, now is really the, a good time. So we'll talk more on the spawning season a little bit later, but that's all to encourage you to come out to Fire Island to get a glimpse of these guys, their real prehistoric beauties. Um, so if you know only, you know, a few facts about horseshoe crabs, you probably know that they're really old. They're like super ancient um, and not just old, but like, really old. <laughs> the ancestors of contemporary horseshoe crabs, the guys that we see on our beaches today, um, emerged, likely emerged somewhere between three and four hundred million years ago. So that is before the dinosaurs. You know, these guys have been around for a very long time. I believe the dinosaurs went extinct around 180 million years ago. So they actually predate them and survived longer. Um, we know this because it's not uncommon to find horseshoe crabs in the fossil record. Um, it's natural, of course, to expect that horseshoe crabs would show up in the fossil record, uh, especially when you consider their range and their habitat. As bottom feeders, they spend most of their time on the bottom of the seafloor or on bay bottoms, um, looking for scraps of food to eat, to just toss into their mouths. Uh, they spend a great deal of their time really deep in the ocean and in mucky and muddy areas. Uh, because they're trudging around that mud, they're exposed more than a lot of other creatures to the very unique conditions that are ripe for the process of fossilization. So one of the reasons why we do have a lot of their fossils is just because they lived in, you know, muck, which is easy, easily fossilized, right? Um, horseshoe crabs have a few, a few very close relatives. The first one I should mention are trilobites. Trilobites, very close relatives of horseshoe crabs. You'll find them in the fossil record, occupying very similar geographical areas and also uh, time period. So they were probably contemporaries of each other for a very long time. You would have seen them together uh, in the ancient oceans. Um, today, the closest living relatives of horseshoe crabs are actually spiders, scorpions, and another like Fire Island favorite, um, ticks. We get a lot of ticks. Uh, each belongs to the phylum Anthropoda, uh, mean, which means jointed legs. Horseshoe crabs are also in a subphylum, and I'm trying to say this name, I might butcher it a little bit, uh, Chelicerata, Chelicerata, <laughs> a name that's hard for me to pronounce, uh, which means claw or horn in the front of their mouth. We'll be talking about the anatomy in just a moment, so I'll give you a closer idea of what that means. Um, furthermore, they're a member of a class called Merostomata, uh, which means thigh mouth. Uh, and that's, again, something we'll be talking about in just a moment. Now, there are actually four distinct species of horseshoe crab on Earth today. Each one occupies the eastern coast of the continent where you can find it. Um, so three of those species are native to Asia. Uh, our species is called Limulus polyphemus. 
uh, it's native to North, North America and South America in some areas. Um, the scientific name for this animal is Limulus polyphemus, uh, which roughly translates to uh, an unusual one-eyed giant. Um, it's a reference to Greek mythology. I'd really like to know the story behind, you know, the person who named the creature, uh, because it feels like uh, calling it a one-eyed giant is actually a very inappropriate name for this animal, uh, considering the fact that it doesn't just have one eye, but it has many eyes. And again, we'll be talking more about that in just a minute. So just to talk a little bit about the anatomy of horseshoe crabs, we can see when we look at a horseshoe crab, three main body sections. We can see this front part right here. Uh, this is the front carapace or the prosoma. Then we can see this back hinge over here. Uh, that is the, and again, I'm probably mispronouncing it, opisthosoma, <laughs> which is, you know, their rear section. Uh, and then they also have this back part of the horseshoe crab, this over here is the prosoma. Um, then behind it, we have the opisthosoma. I'm so bad at pronouncing that word. And then at the rear, we have the tailson. I always thought very conveniently named part of the body because it sounds like tail. Um, and a lot of people think of it as a tail. In fact, it's very similar to a tail. It's used in a very similar way. Um, horseshoe crabs are really strange. One of the funny things about horseshoe crabs is that they have so many eyes, not just one eye, as their name would imply, Limulus polyphemus, uh, not two eyes, but they actually have 10 separate eyes, or I should qualify that by saying eye-like sensors that are scattered around their whole body. Um, so the first eyes that you'll notice with most horseshoe crabs are these guys right here. Um, they look a whole lot like, uh, almost like a bug's eyes. Those are compound eyes, so similar to the way that like uh, a fly sees. They can kind of see in many different directions, almost a kaleidoscopic view of things. Um, those are their lateral compound eyes. They also have right behind those lateral eyes are two small rudimentary eyes um, that are pretty hard to see, uh, fairly microscopic, very small. Um, in the front, they have two median eyes and two endo and a single endoparietal eye. These are fairly primitive light sensors. They can only pick up a little bit of information. And then on the underside of their shell, and we'll see a little bit of the underside later on, they do have two ventral eyes. Those ventral eyes are also very small, hard to notice unless you know what you're looking for um, or unless you have like special equipment. They also have photoreceptors along their tail, not something that you can call a proper eye. Uh, photoreceptors tell them whether or not there's light out or whether or not it's dark. It gives them a little bit more sensory information, but it's not super robust, those eyes. Um, whether or not horseshoe crabs see well is another story. Uh, in my experience, horseshoe crabs don't have the best vision, um, but they do use all of these different light sensors, all of these different primitive eyes and these compound eyes as well to help them to scavenge, to find food, um, but also to help them tell whether or not it's day, day out or night out, whether or not uh, the full moon is out or missing which is important, especially as we talk a little bit more about the spawning cycle in a little bit. Um, in the front of the horseshoe crab shell, we get these two small claws. Um, these claws harken back to uh, their, um, their classification, uh, the subphylum, uh, Chelicerata, uh, again, have a hard time pronouncing it. Um, so they have these two claws right up front. Those are really specialized claws. They use those claws to help guide food into their mouth. And we'll be talking about the mouth in just a moment. They're a little bit more dexterous, so they can kind of manipulate those claws a little bit more easily than they can manipulate some of their other claws. And they basically use it to munch food, right? They also have five pairs or 10 walking legs. Um, each one has a small claw at the end right here. Uh, you can get a good view. I'm trying to look where in the image you can really see the claws. You can kind of see the claw right here and you can see its shadow. Uh, they use those legs to move around the ocean floor 
They spend most of their time on the ocean floor looking for worms, looking for clams, looking for all sorts of small little things that they can eat. Um, they also use those claws uh, to help them manipulate their environment, to crawl along the shoreline, to dig holes in, in the shore, which is again important for the spawning cycle. Now what those claws aren't really used for is as pincers. A lot of people see horseshoe crabs and they get a little spooked because horseshoe crabs, they got those two claws right there. And you can imagine all those claws pinching really hard, but I can tell you firsthand, Horseshoe crabs don't have a very strong grip. They're not gonna hurt you if they pinch you. They're not like blue claw crabs or any of those other things, which as a slight aside, I should say, even though they're called horseshoe crabs, they're not true crabs at all. As we mentioned before, their closest relatives are actually like scorpions and spiders. So they're pretty far removed from crabs, from proper crabs, I should say. Um, they also have, uh, you, so they have three main pairs of walking legs, and they have one pair of pusher legs in the back. Um, they use that to sort of help propel them along the ground. And then actually, if you ever get a really close look at those two legs, they almost look like fans, and they use those fans to help them swim through the water, to help them push, you know, as if they were paddling. Now taking a closer look at the inside carapace, right at the underside of the carapace here, are those two front claws that they used to eat. We can also see all of these right here, these little bristles right here. Um, these bristles are nathobases. That's the proper name for them. I always think of the bristles as being a little bit like, but not exactly like their teeth. It's what they use to chew, to grind up food, to make it so that they can eat whatever they're grabbed onto. Again, most of what they eat are things like small clams, uh, snails, uh, garbage that just ends up on the bottom of the ocean floor. Um, so they use those nathobases or these bristles right here in the middle to guide that food into their mouth and to also chew that food. Um, and then behind the mouth back here, uh, and I'll get a better view, uh, this one is a shell, so it's been eaten, eaten away, but hopefully we'll see another photo of the underside. I think I have it elsewhere in the slideshow. I'll show you it. But right here, you would have the book gills, and they use their book gills for breathing. Obviously, they need, you know, to bring oxygen into their bodies in order to keep their bodies working. Uh, and they use those book gills the same way a fish uses its gills to breathe in the water. Although it's very different from a fish's gills. If you've ever seen them, you know, it's funny that they're called book gills because they look just like the pages of a book, opening and closing. Um, and they also use those book gills for propulsion. Uh, so when they're swimming, Oftentimes you'll see them swimming underwater and they actually open and close those book gills as a way to float themselves through the water. Um, and then finally, that book gill, that section is actually the place where they intake water when they prepare to molt because horseshoe crabs, very similar to spiders and scorpions, they need to lose their shells every now and then. Their shells get a little bit too small, they get a little too big, so they gotta crawl out of their shells. And one way that they do that is by bringing water in through their book gills in order to crack their old shell so that they can crawl out of it. So that's another important use of that rear book gill element over here. Now to take a moment to talk about the tailson right here. Tailsons have a lot of baggage. Uh, people will tell you all sorts of things. I hear from kids all the time that they're stingers. I can tell you it's not a stinger. Their tailson is harmless, although I should say, I guess it can be a little sharp. So if you were to like step on it wrong, maybe that would hurt. Um, but it's not a stinger at all. It's, uh, it's a tail. And it's a tail that they use mostly to help them steer through the water. It's a little bit of a rudder in that way. Um, but they also use it to help themselves get off of their backs when they get caught on their backs. You see, because horseshoe crabs are almost a little bit like turtles. When they get stuck on their backs, it's really hard for them to flip themselves over. And that's what they use their tailson for. Now, park rangers like me will tell you, don't touch the tailson. And it's not that we're telling you not to touch the tailson because it's a stinger. We're telling you not to touch the tailson because the tailson is incredibly fragile. If you break the tailson, there's a little bit of flesh that connects the tailson to the rest of the body right here. If you break or even if you hurt and injure that, that small bit of flesh right there, you run the risk of, you know, making it so that the horseshoe crab can't right itself, can't flip itself over when it's caught on its back, which of course 
means that it can't survive when it's out of the water. So tail sins, not a stinger, nothing to worry about there, uh, but you do wanna watch out for them. You don't want to, um, you don't want to touch them because you might hurt them. Uh, real quick, I want to make sure that I'm sharing the proper screen. Can you guys see my notes? There are no notes on this page, but... No, uh, you're good. Okay, I was like, because I see the green bar around the wrong screen, and I was like, uh-oh. But anyway, I'll continue. <laughs> um, you'll also see on their bodies um, something called syncelium. Uh, they have large and small syncelium, um, and those syncelium are what their name implies. Those are the little spines that you'll see along their bodies, and those little spines help them to sense, hence the name syncelium. Um, they use their syncelium basically as a way to feel things. Those are their touch receptors. You can imagine if you're a creature like a horseshoe crab and you've got this dense exoskeleton, that it can be a little hard for you to feel things that are outside of that exoskeleton. Well, that's what the syncelium are for. As touch receptors, they also have syncelium that are chemical receptors for helping them to taste the water, to helping help them smell you know, what's around them. Um, now, if you want to take a look at horseshoe crabs, a really close look at horseshoe crabs, uh, one thing to mention is that horseshoe crabs do come in male and female formats. Usually just from a distance, you can kind of guess what a horseshoe crab is because the females are almost always 25 to 30% larger than males at maturity. So you could be looking at a younger horseshoe crab, you never really know. The only real easy way to tell a horseshoe crab, whether it's male or a female, is by looking at their underside. When you look at the underside of their shell, you'll see one of these claws right here and I can show you the positioning of it. It would be this first set of claws. So the one that we're seeing here is actually a female because her claws look like scissors the way that the rest of her claws look, whereas males actually have this. Um, it's almost a hook uh, and it almost looks like a boxing glove. We always say they look like they're wearing little boxing gloves, which, you know, <laughs> is a masculine trait, I suppose. Um, they use those hooks to hold themselves onto females during the spawning cycle. Uh, now, that's not that they're like engaged in reproduction then and there. The funny thing about male and female horseshoe crabs is that because females are larger, they're a little bit stronger. They can move longer distances. They can really carry themselves up onto the beach in a way that male horseshoe crabs, much smaller and a little bit weaker, have trouble doing. So male horseshoe crabs actually use these little boxing gloves, use these little hooks to grab onto the females as a way to hitch a ride to the shoreline because they're just like a little bit weaker, a little bit less capable swimmers than the females are. So that's one of the easy ways to tell them about uh, apart. They've got this round and this arch right here. Now, something that you won't see on the horseshoe crab, hopefully you'll never have a chance to see this, um, would be their blood. You know, one of the funny things about horseshoe crabs is you'll hear people refer to them as blue bloods, right? Uh, and that's because their blood is blue, unlike our blood, which when it is oxidized, it becomes red. Now, the reason why horseshoe crab blood shows blue when it oxidizes, when it's exposed to the air around it, is because it doesn't have hemoglobin like our blood has hemoglobin. They have something called hemocyanin, hemocyanin. Uh, that hemocyanin is a copper-based compound as opposed to our hemoglobin, which is an iron-based compound. Now, I always tell people, it's kind of like the difference between a rusty fence and an old copper penny. It if you see a rusty fence, that iron in the fence as it oxidizes is going to turn bright red. And that's where you get that nice red color that comes from rust. Whereas if you've ever seen a really, really old penny, when the copper from that penny is exposed to oxygen, it turns kind of blue, kind of green. And that's horseshoe crab blood. They have copper in their blood instead of the iron that we have in, in our blood. Now, hemoglobin and hemocyanin are used to carry oxygen through the blood's through the bloodstream. They carry it to the cells that need oxygen in order to engage in all sorts of different chemical reactions that produce life, right? Now, when that hemoglobin, when that hemocyanin is exposed to oxygen, it turns that bluish color. I say, I hope you never see it because you'd really only see it if they were injured or 
and we'll talk about it in a little bit if you see it in medicine, just like we see right here. Now, talking a little bit about the life history of horseshoe crabs, I mentioned a little while ago that we are right in the like perfect time of year to be looking for them because we're right in the middle of their spawning season. I should change the slide because they don't really breed, they spawn. And what I mean by that is just like when you imagine a salmon spawning, salmon swim up the stream, the female salmon lay their eggs, the male salmon fertilize their eggs and they swim out the stream. Very different from like say birds, the way that birds couple and reproduce. Um, horseshoe crabs spawn just like salmon. Instead of rivers, they come to calm bayside beaches. The females will spend some time, they'll dig holes into the ground and the males will come in and they will fertilize the eggs that were laid in those holes. And when you see the eggs on the beach, they look like this, almost kind of gray, green, maybe a little hint of blue, these small, teeny tiny little pearls. They get bigger over the first few weeks as they incubate and eventually uh, you can start to make out horseshoe crabs, little tiny baby horseshoe crabs inside of those eggs. It's honestly one of the most amazing things I've ever seen is a little tiny baby horseshoe crab floating around in these eggs that are just bigger than like a grain of sand. They're so teeny tiny. Now, over the course of their lifetime, it takes a female roughly nine to 10 years of age before they're able to reproduce. Males actually mature just a little bit before females. So males tend to be mature and ready, re ready to reproduce around eight to nine years. Um, on average, the female horseshoe crab can hold over 60,000 eggs, teeny tiny little bluish green eggs um, that they, then, uh, you know, bury in the sand uh, during the spawning se season. Now the spawning, uh, though it takes place, you can see them all the time, basically from May to June, you might get lucky and see a couple on the beaches, but the bulk of the spawning season, when the majority of them are coming to the beach at the same time, that corresponds roughly uh, with the either full moon cycle or new moon cycle. Now you can imagine the full moon and new moon cycles, those are really important because the moon controls our tides. Uh, they would be coming in at the highest of high tides to lay their eggs. They lay their eggs in the sand and then those tides start to flow out. Now they do that because they know their eggs tend to take somewhere between three and four weeks to hatch, which roughly corresponds with the lunar cycle. So the next highest full moon where they've laid their eggs will come in just as those eggs are starting to hatch into these tiny little larvae that look just like trilobites. Um, they don't have the tail sin that the mature adult uh, horseshoe crabs have at first. They look just like little trilobites. When that tide comes in, they'll sweep up all of those newly hatched little trilobite larvae almost exactly one month after they've been laid and they'll be swept out into the sea, into the um, tidal wetlands, into the marshes, into rivers, into the bay, and all of these other places. Now, the rate of development of those eggs is dependent largely upon environmental cues. So what the temperature is like, what the weather is like, what the moisture of the atmosphere is like, and what oxygen content in the water is like. So it can vary a little bit. Sometimes you'll see them laying their eggs a couple of days before the full moon or a couple of days after the full moon, but it roughly corresponds and you could almost always catch them during the full moon cycle if you know exactly where to look. Now, when uh, horseshoe crab larvae first hatch, uh, they are teeny little tiny creatures. They almost look like uh, trilobites. They don't have the tail sin uh, that we have. This is like one of the earliest molts that you'll see in their cycle. So this starts to look a lot more like a horseshoe crab. You can even see the little tail sin right there. And they'll go through several molts within their first few years as they get bigger and bigger with each molt. The same way you can imagine, again, spiders or scorpions or even like cicadas, you know, cicadas leave molts all over the place. Um, uh, you know, the larvae usually float around in the water for around one week um, to two weeks before they go through their first molt. And it's after that first molt that they get that little tail sin that they start to go from being plankton, 
which plankton is basically anything, whether it's a plant or an animal in the water that just kind of floats around that can't really control where it's going, right? Um, so crabs produce plankton. All of these creatures start their lives off as planktons, including horseshoe crabs. About a week goes by and they start to molt. They start to get bigger. They start to gain their tailson. And they start to go from being those teeny tiny little floating plankton to being actual like horseshoe crabs that we know them. After that point, the juveniles will usually stay in shallow waters, whether they're in bays or just at the head of rivers or tidal wetlands, places like that. They'll stay there for anywhere between one and two years. Uh, that's why you tend to see lots of molts, especially in like late August is when I tend to find them, even September. Uh, and that's because you have a generation that's preparing to move out into the ocean, that generation that had been laid the year before. So they'll molt several times in their first year, and then they go through one more molt before they go out into the ocean. After that point, it's actually a little bit hard to track the life cycle of horseshoe crabs, although we've been doing a lot of research, a lot of different groups have been doing research over the last few years. Um, and I say it's hard to track because uh, they are hard to monitor. Uh, they do travel some pretty significant distances. Uh, they go really deep in the ocean. Um, and when we keep them in captivity, their life cycles are interrupted. Their life cycles are a little bit different from what you would see in the wild. So it's honestly pretty hard to say how long horseshoe crabs live for. I've heard everything from 20 to 30 years. I don't know if there's any more current research than the last you know, paper that I read on that. Um, again, it's just sort of hard to tell. And I'll talk a little bit about the monitoring and research that's been going on, um, yeah. But an interesting fact I learned pretty recently is that apparently about 97% of all horseshoe crabs, 97.5% of all horseshoe crabs actually uh, are lost or mostly eaten uh, <laughs> in the first uh, week of their life, basically, that planktonic stage that we were talking about before, before they even go through their first few molts. Um, now, the horseshoe crabs, their eggs, those plankton, every different part of their life cycle uh, is an important food source for pretty much everything out that you'll find in the water, whether it's fish that are going to be spending a lot of time eating their plankton, uh, whether it's seagulls that like to eat the adults, the seagulls, you'll see them toss them over on the beach, um, or even shorebirds like this red knot right here. Red knots are really fascinating birds. They travel incredible distances from South America to Canada, some very, very long migrations. And their migrations are actually carefully tuned with the horseshoe crab's breeding cycle because during the peak of their migration, they want to be on beaches that are covered in horseshoe crab eggs. That's because they need a lot of food. They need a lot of energy to get them on the rest of their migration. Now, red knots are uh, considered to be threatened, uh, so they're protected under the Endangered Species Act. Um, their populations are very tied to horseshoe crabs, and we can see pretty direct correlations between dives in horseshoe crabs populations and dives in red knot populations. Um, young horseshoe crabs also provide food for other birds, so not just red knots, but also, you know, everything from kill deer to uh, sanderlings, piping plovers may very well eat their eggs. Um, they'll also provide food for crabs, whelks, fish. Uh, larger ones are actually a great food source for sea turtles. You'd be surprised, and I mean, I was surprised to learn that sea turtles like to chew on them, like to bite them. Um, gulls also frequently will go after adults. This time of year, you start seeing lots of dead adults ashore because gulls have gotten to them during the um, spawning season. Um, foxes, raccoons, all sorts of different creatures love to eat horseshoe crabs. Horseshoe crabs are also really important because they host miniature biomes, teeny tiny little ecosystems on their bodies. Uh, those ecosystems can include slipper shells, which are these tiny little almost ear-shaped shells that you'll find on our beaches. They like to latch themselves to the side of horseshoe crabs. You'll also see snails on the bodies of horseshoe crabs, mussels, barnacles, seagrass, um, and something called limulus leech, which I believe is a species of um, flatworm that is endemic uh, as a parasite to horseshoe crab populations and pretty much only horseshoe crab populations. So 
human, uh, humans have for a very long time used horseshoe crabs for a variety of different purposes. Um, indigenous Americans use them for fertilizers. Uh, later agriculture, like industrially sized agriculture, also used them as fertilizer. The reason why they're so commonly used as fertilizer is because, especially back in the day when there were pretty much a lot more than we see today, um, they were really easy to gather in the thousands. You could just go onto the beach during the spawning cycle and just gather tons and tons of them. And then you can use that to produce fertilizer. Um, they were also used as feed for livestock. Um, so sometimes they would be turned into food for, for cows and other, other animals. Um, the chitin uh, from their exoskeleton is used uh, or has been, I don't think it's used anymore, but has been used in the production of contact lenses. It's also used in the production of skin cream, of uh, biomedical like sutures, so like stitches and things like that. Uh, burn dressings, antacids. Um, that chitin is all very easy to gather from horseshoe crabs, again, because there are a whole lot of horseshoe crabs out there. You can gather them very quickly. Um, in 1967, scientists won a Nobel Prize for some of the research that they were doing on horseshoe crabs, specifically on the optical nerve of horseshoe crabs. And the reason why they were looking at horseshoe crabs as optical nerves is because horseshoe crabs have one of the longest optical nerves compared to their body size of any animal on earth. So if you're trying to understand the way that sight works, you want to look for something that has a long optical nerve to analyze, and horseshoe crabs were the perfect creatures. So scientists were actually able to study the optical nerve and eyes of horseshoe crabs in order to understand how our eyes translate color, light, and dark into signals that our brain can read as colors, as uh, shades, as shapes, and ultimately as the world. So it's, it's kind of cool to think about that. Uh, more recently, uh, and you may have heard about this, and I regret that my uh, photograph is like so low resolution. It wasn't before, uh, but you may have heard about limulus amoebocyte lysate, or LAL, which is derived from horseshoe crab blood. Um, so for many years, people have harvested horseshoe crabs. Uh, their blood is incredibly valuable, and it's valuable because it contains something called Limulus amoebocyte lysate. Um, it's a kind of he, it's a it's a kind of hemoglobin. Although as we talked before, uh, they don't have hemoglobin; they have the copper-based uh, hemoglobin equivalent. Um, and the reason why we harvest it from horseshoe crabs is because their blood uh, coagulates in the presence of bacterial infections. So amoebas or bacterial infections, things like that, their blood clots when it finds bacteria. Probably part of the reason why horseshoe crabs have been around for such a long time, because they have this excellent adaptation in their immune system that pretty much nothing else has, or nothing, nothing else has that we, we know of for the most part. Um, so we harvest horseshoe crab blood, we use it to derive the LAL. Uh, that LAL is really important because you need it in order to test the sterility of all sorts of different medical things. So vaccines, including the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, medical devices and medical equipment. So if you're having a major surgery, they need to make sure those instruments are sterilized and they use the LAL from horseshoe crabs in order to test that it is sterile, that there is no bacteria present. This became very important, you know, when you consider it in the context of a globe-spanning pandemic, uh, because suddenly you have to produce a lot of vaccines and you've got to get those vaccines long distances as they're being shipped overseas. And that is a recipe for disaster if you think about bacterial infections, but we have the LAL from horseshoe crabs in order to ensure that all of those uh, transported are not infected with bacteria over the course of their travels. In 2018, a scientist by the name of Ellie Lilly developed a synthetic form of LAL, uh, which may be used to cut as many as much as like 90% of all horseshoe crab like harvesting. Uh, I should say that horseshoe crab harvesting is very closely monitored and regulated. Uh, horseshoe crabs are not killed when they're pulled out of the water outright. 
the people who are harvesting their blood uh, are under an obligation uh, to try as best they can to make sure that the horseshoe crabs are returned to the water uninjured. There is a certain amount of blood that is allowed to be taken from horseshoe crabs and you're not allowed to take any more than that, all with the goal of course of preserving the population. Now that said, horseshoe crab populations do still are still affected by the harvesting of blood because even though you know, you can try really hard not to make this a difficult experience for a horseshoe crab. You can imagine being pulled out of the water and having your blood drained probably wouldn't be a very uh, relaxing experience. And it's not for them either. Um, so hopefully in the future, transitioning away from LAL from horseshoe crabs uh, towards the any number of different synthetic alternatives will be important. There are also scientists who have been working for a very long time on uh, what should I say? Uh, basically, uh, raising horseshoe crabs inside, like as livestock, uh, instead of affecting natural populations outside. Um, but there are issues and complexities with that research as well. Um, it's not exactly super efficient at this point. Um, although, with any luck, you will be able to alleviate some of the stress on the natural population. Um, they also use uh, the LAL to test for uh, uh, infections that are associated with diseases. Uh, they also use it to test water quality, uh, to test foods and drugs for contamination. So it's really important. NASA has even used LAL on the space station, on the International Space Station and on satellites uh, in order to make sure that when we send you know, rockets out into space, we're not sending them covered in bacteria for all of the aliens to enjoy. You know, We wanna make sure all of those are sterile as well. So that's all tested with LAL. Now, there are many different threats to horseshoe crab populations. Um, and so, you know, I always like to take a pause here because uh, I talk to a lot of folks who have been around, who have been visiting Fire Island since long before I even, I even was alive, let alone visited Fire Island. And oftentimes they'll come to me and tell me that horseshoe crabs used to be a lot more common than they are now. One of the really unfortunate things about horseshoe crabs is that people have only somewhat recently become interested in studying their population sizes. So we don't actually have a lot of solid data on, on like how large their populations are going back other than like oral memory photographs like this photograph I have down here. Again, regrettably low resolution. I'm sorry on that, uh, where you can just see these piles of horseshoe crabs. There's not a lot of heavy data. There's just kind of memory and photographs to tell us how many horseshoe crabs used to be around. And anecdotally speaking, it seems like horseshoe crabs, uh, their population has declined quite a bit. Now, part of that is probably related to the biomedical harvest, um, the taking of horseshoe crabs in order to derive LAL, um, that substance I was just talking about. Um, Hopefully that's not having a huge impact on their population because again, they're supposed to be tossed back into the water alive and healthy. But again, it's going to have a natural effect on their population because it is a traumatic experience. They do get injured and I'm sure any number of things can go wrong. Um, but there are some other things that are like affecting their population even more directly, I would say, including situations like bycatch. It's not unusual for horseshoe crabs to be caught in large nets uh, when people are fishing for other things. Horseshoe crabs also get caught the same way lobsters get caught, except they're not getting used the way lobsters get used. Um, crabs and all sorts of other things. So they do get caught accidentally, and that contributes a great deal to the decline of the population. Probably, and I think one of the biggest threats to horseshoe crabs uh, has to do with coastal development and loss of habitat. Now we've been talking about the life cycle of horseshoe crabs, and I was mentioning that they come to our beaches to lay their eggs. But one of the things that's been happening over the course of the last few decades, as all sorts of other things have happened, whether it's erosion or sea level rise, is you will have people who are building along the coast uh, who want to fortify their homes, their properties, their businesses, their marinas, um, any number of other structures. And they do that by building walls that are called bulkheads in the water. So if you're, ever, if you're ever on a boat or coming close to shore and you see a wooden wall just along the shoreline helping to protect the shoreline, helping to keep it from eroding or you know, getting swept up by sea level rise, uh, those bulkheads are maybe important for some reasons uh, stabilizing, you know, beaches, but those bulkheads 
uh, are something that is you know basically impossible for horseshoe crabs to traverse. They can't climb over the top of those bulkheads. Uh, and so what you see is nice flat sandy beaches for them lay their eggs, suddenly get replaced by these bulkheads that keep them from laying their eggs. And as a result, the number of beaches that horseshoe crabs are able to lay their eggs on has declined sharply over the last several decades. Climate change is likely having an impact on horseshoe crabs. Um, bait harvesting, one of the biggest things that horseshoe crabs are used for uh, is as bait for whelk, uh, uh, you know, squingili, if you've ever heard of it, um, and eel. It's a very popular bait for eel. And then, of course, water quality, which affects, uh, of course, the adults are quite hardy, but the small ones, the larvae, can't really survive the herbicides, the insecticides, uh, the fertilizers, uh, the heavy metals, and everything else that we are putting into the water uh, through runoff um, and through any number of other factors. Uh, so that's all to say, horseshoe crabs have a lot you know, a lot threatening them, a lot of big problems along the way. Overfishing is probably one of the biggest. Um, in the 1870s, um, around 4 million horseshoe crabs are estimated to have been harvested a year. Um, that was really the peak of horseshoe crab harvesting for fertilizers specifically. Um, so they were mostly pulled for fertilizers and bait. Uh, in the 1960s, before the development of LAL, that, that lysate we were talking about before, um, horseshoe crab harvest became very uncommon. Uh, it was really only common to uh, pull them from the water in order to use them as bait for eels and whelks and things like that. So around 100,000 were estimated to be harvested in the 1960s, um, in any given year of the 1960s. In the 1970s, around uh, 20,000 pounds were being harvested. By the 1990s, 2 million pounds were being harvested. And by the end of the 1990s and 1997, um, about 6 million pounds were, were harvested. Uh, oh, I'm reading that wrong. Yeah, 6 million pounds. Uh, that number has been changing quite a bit. Uh, you know, at the peak in 1997, we had about 2.7 million individuals that were being harvested. Uh, in 2013, an estimate of about 1.5 million individuals were being harvested. So the number sort of peaked and now it's going down a little bit, especially as alternatives are found to the LAL, um, but also as alternatives are found for uh, bait and for, you know, we don't use them for fertilizer very much anymore. Um, New York State has voluntarily set the limit at one half of what the federal limit for horseshoe crabs are. So if you are, you know, making a living gathering horseshoe crabs, you can get a permit, get around 150,000 a year. Um, after that point, you know, for the whole fishery, after that point, uh, commercial, the commercial season shuts down uh, twice, actually, during the harvesting season. Um, in 2019, a uh, benchmark stock assessment. Uh, so uh, somebody who monitors like fish stocks and other things, uh, found that generally speaking in New York State, the status of horseshoe crabs is still relatively poor, but that they have stabilized in the mid-Atlantic region, so anywhere from like Chesapeake Bay to like North Carolina, and that they're actually increasing in the south. So broadly speaking, the Atlantic horseshoe crab Limulus polyphemus's population seems to be doing okay further south than it is doing up here this far north. Um, but that is changing quite a bit and hopefully will continue to change um, as people continue to recognize all of the different things that are impacting horseshoe crab populations. Um, in 2009, Fire Island National Seashore, so the folks that I'm coming in from, uh, we actually banned horseshoe crab fishing in our waters. Um, we prefer to think of our waters as a, res a reservoir um, for the Great South Bay and for horseshoe crabs in the Great South Bay. So basically a breeding ground, a safe place, a place that they can go in order to reproduce at high rates, um, hopefully contributing to the overall horseshoe crab population. Now there was one really intimate study that was conducted between 2011 and 2014 that was looking at things like uh, the number of spawning females and clustering uh, males, uh, the number of single females and single males 
uh, the length and width of horseshoe crabs we were measuring, whether or not uh, a larger number was male or female, because we want to make sure that that ratio is relatively even. Um, and also we were looking at the way that beach and weather conditions affect their populations. And we were doing all of that uh, in part by tagging them in congruence uh, or in collaboration with Fish and Wildlife Service uh, and many different universities and things like that. So this is a study that is still ongoing. You might still see those tags out on a horseshoe crab if you ever see one of these tags. They're circular tags, they're not yellow, they're white. And you'll see them right on the side of the horseshoe crab right here. Um, those tags are being used in order to monitor things like population size and where they travel. Um, so give that hotline uh, a call and the phone number is on the tag uh, to give them information about your horseshoe crab. You'll get a nice little pewter pin, like a, like, like a little metal pin in the mail. Um, and you might learn a little bit more about that horseshoe crab. You'll also be contributing to some really important and really valuable research, research into horseshoe crabs. Um, you know, talking about beach and weather conditions is actually pretty important because storms, you know, storms like Hurricane Sandy can actually have an impact on horseshoe crab populations. And any major offense that impact horseshoe crab populations are pretty dangerous because, of course, if you lose a whole generation of horseshoe crabs, a whole year, let's say, of horseshoe crabs, you need at least 10 years for that population to recover because it does take 10 years for them to reach maturity. Unlike many other species of fish or of crustacean or arthropod um, that reaches maturity much more quickly than horseshoe crabs, horseshoe crab populations, they tend to lag. Uh, they don't bounce back right away. Uh, so sometimes the effects of the population that we see now, uh, you know, uh, is really because of the work that was done 10 years ago in order to help support the population, if that makes sense. Uh, uh, so at Fire Island National Seashore, we're continuing to perform surveys. This is one of the tags right here um, on the side of the horseshoe crab. You can see the phone number, uh, 188 Limulus, very easy, 1888 Limulus, very easy to remember. Um, and when you find them, you report them and then you release them, get them back into the water nice and safe. Of course, you want to be careful when you're handling them, not because they're dangerous, but because you don't want to injure them. Um, we also monitor populations elsewhere in the park, so not just the Lighthouse Beach, where we really do a lot of focus, um, but we also look at places like our federal wilderness area, which is closer to Smith Point um, and other sites like that. And we do all of this in coordination with the New York State Department of Ecological Conservation, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, several different universities are all also used or engaged in order to observe horseshoe crab populations. It's a big volunteer effort and we do actually look for horseshoe crab volunteers. If anyone is interested in helping us perform those surveys, um, I can give you my contact information later on. You can send me an email and I'll send you to the right people. <laughs> um, so New York State and uh, DEC and the Cornell Cooperative Extension do a lot of really important monitoring of horseshoe crabs. Um, in 2015, they recognized, based on the state's wildlife action plan, horseshoe crabs as being a high priority species of greatest conservation need. So horseshoe crabs are not, you know, the thing I always say is they're not endangered. There are lots of horseshoe crabs out there, but they might be in danger in the sense that their population is has over the last couple of decades dropped pretty sharply. Um, so they are a high priority species, meaning that a lot of, uh, of you know, a lot of research is done on them. Um, a lot of resources are put into monitoring them and in, are put into ensuring um, that they are not being over harvested uh, for their blood or for fertilizer or for bait or any number of other things. Um, the DEC advocated the banning of importing Asian horseshoe crabs um, in accordance to international law. Uh, much of the horseshoe crabs that are harvested, and I would almost say like, it could be very well be more dire for Asian species of horseshoe crabs than for the Atlantic species, uh, because there are three separate species in Asia, slightly larger population of horseshoe crabs. Uh, there's also a larger uh, tendency to harvest them. Uh, so, you know, uh, DUC advocated banning imports of Asian horseshoe crabs for that reason, in order to help preserve those populations too. Um, Brookhaven Town and the DEC 
banned harvest of horseshoe crabs at, Me at West Meadow and parts of Cedar Beach where it was traditionally done in high capacity. Um, and today Malloy College continues to survey along with Sacred Heart University, uh, Long Island's Great South Bay and the Long Island Sound as well. Uh, Lemulus polyphemus was recently listed as being vulnerable. Um, and one of the Asian species has actually been listed as threatened as of uh, 2019. Um, I haven't checked to see if that list has updated, uh, has been updated since 2019, uh, but I'll have to double check on that one. Um, so I wanna take a quick minute and answer any questions that folks have. Um, I do have some resources if anyone wants to look through, including information about the park biologist who knows a whole lot more about horseshoe crabs than even I know. I could tell you a lot. Um, I can share those resources. I could share this PowerPoint with you if you're interested. Um, I want to recommend one thing. We have, uh, you know, materials for young readers. Um, and then I also want to recommend, and I'm realizing I'm going over time, uh, two really great uh, things, a documentary called Crash, A Tale of Two Species, that talks about the relationship between red knots, those uh, migratory birds that are threatened, uh, and horseshoe crabs. Uh, that's a great documentary that's called A Tale of Two Species, Crash, A Tale of Two Species. Um, and then a book that I highly recommend is by Lisa Jean Moore. It's published in 2018. It's called Catch and Release, The Enduring Yet Vulnerable Horseshoe Crab. It's a book that is about horseshoe crabs, but uh, Lisa Jean Moore is actually a, an anthropologist uh, by trade. So she's actually not just studying horseshoe crabs from a biological perspective, but also thinking about how horseshoe crabs interact with humans, how humans interact with horseshoe crabs and the really unique cultural conditions. So if you're gonna read a book on horseshoe crabs, I would recommend that book. Um, and I can share those later on, but I'm gonna stop my share uh, and give you guys an opportunity to ask me questions. Uh, I wanna apologize again for the technical issues. Uh, I don't know why my computer was crashing, but I'm glad I have my personal computer for this. Um, yeah. Does anyone have any questions? Let me look in the chat box. Let's see. Um, you're welcome to unmute it if you feel the need to unmute. Uh, somebody asking if it's being recorded. I do believe it's being recorded. Okay, it's gonna be added to the YouTube page. So you can check it out on the YouTube page. Once done, hopefully it's edited to get rid of all of my disappearance. <laughs> yes, I'll take care of it. <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, I did see a couple questions right at the end, yeah. Yeah. How can you make a living harvesting slash catching horseshoe crabs? That's a good question. You would have to ask the folks who do it. Um, because the horseshoe crab's blood, uh, you can derive that LAL from it. Um, even though it's sharply regulated and it's hard to get the permits to actually do that kind of harvesting, that blood is very valuable. Um, it's, it's like an insane uh, number. So I can imagine you making a lot of money harvesting horseshoe crab blood. Otherwise, uh, when it comes to harvesting horseshoe crabs for, we don't really do it for fertilizer anymore, but really for bait. Uh, you don't really make a living harvesting horseshoe crabs for bait. You make a, har a living harvesting horseshoe crabs for bait to catch things that you make a living off of, if that makes sense. So whelks are a lot more valuable than horseshoe crabs. Uh, eels are a lot more valuable than horseshoe crabs. If they take years to mature to be able to spawn, how long do they spawn within their, oh, how long, how often, or how long do they spawn within their lifespan? You know, I was talking a little while ago about how difficult it is to actually monitor their, their life cycles, to know how long horseshoe crabs survive for. And the reason for that is because first, this tagging research, those tags that have been affixed to horseshoe crabs, that's only been happening over the last like 10 years or so. So we don't have a lot of data going back further than that. Uh, and we would need to keep gathering data from those tags in order to tell, okay, we saw a wild horseshoe crab that was tagged 10 years ago. So we know they lived for 10 years or, oh, we have, you know, 10 years from now, it's possible that we'll find one that was tagged 20 years ago. And then we know that they can survive for 20 years. You know, that's all speculative. Um, we'll have to see the way that research, you know, pans out on that. Um, I will say, uh, domestic, like not domestic, I shouldn't say domestic, but horseshoe crabs that are raised in a lab uh, as part of research are very unreliable gauges for the lifespan of a horseshoe crab uh, because maybe their conditions are better and they live longer, or maybe their conditions are worse and they don't live as long. So 
The best answer I've ever gotten is they probably live for around 20 to 30 years, relatively speaking, very long life cycles. Um, but, you know, that's, that's a hard question to answer. How much do they spawn throughout their lives? Theoretically, they can spawn for, a ten, for one to two decades. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll open the floor to anyone else if you have questions. I also don't want to keep you waiting. I'm so sorry about my technical problems. And I hope you enjoyed this. And I hope to see you out there to see some real horseshoe crabs. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, did anybody else have any last questions before we uh, finished up for the night? Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it.